tips of the branches back to the smallest group, okay? So anyway, let's just proceed on. Okay, so I'm going to start with reproduction development. That's the most recent lab. And then inverts one and two, and then the rat lab. Um, uh, various photos, movies, get lots of emails about how can I memorize this. A uh, student down here says she has some great flashcards that she's willing to put up for auction. How much did you want? She doesn't know. Okay, anyway. <laughs> flashcards are helpful if you want. Um, making summary diagrams are very useful. So if you try to put maybe information about the crustaceans on one page, these are the various charts we've asked you to fill out repeatedly, okay? So um, try various ways. Talk about the material out loud. At, ask each other questions, okay? I think that's a very useful way to study, okay? So here's some examples. This used to be the timed exam, and then they'd have a minute and 45 for this. So let's just quick do that. Go ahead and start answering these questions. Now, in this exam, you can spend 30 seconds or 30 minutes if you want on this question. I don't recommend 30 minutes. But And this was when it was short answer, where you wrote in the answers. Now it's going to be multiple choice. I heard yay. I agree. Okay, it's been a little over about a minute and 15 seconds. So let's just quick run through this. All right, what you have to do is identify the stages. So this is an eight cell stage. There's four small cells here, four largest cells there. So let's just try to come up with some answers as we go through to try to tie it. What's this darker pole called? Animal, the lighter is the vegetal. That's got lots of yolk. So the egg, if it was unfertilized or fertilized, rotates such that the Vegetal pole is in contact with the substrate. So that's the eight cell stage. This is the ovum. Nice demarcation between the animal and vegetal pole and all one large cell and a very clear spot up there. C is the gastrula stage. What has happened here is this is the blastopore, that ring there. And the blastopore, can you see that? The blastopore there, that ring, is where the cells have migrated inward. So in a deuterostome, which this is, it's a chordate within the deuterostomes, that first opening is the anus, because it's a deuterostome. If it was a protostome, the first opening is the mouth. So that would become the anus in deuterostomes. And then this is the blastula stage, lots of small cells. We don't see the blastocil or the cavity within it, because we don't have a cross section. But if we had a slide that had a cross section, you'd see that blastocil in there. If you had a slide cross section of this, You'd see the blastopore, the lip, and you'd see cells where they migrated to form that archenteron. Question? Stage C is the gastrula stage. Gastrulation is occurring. And the cells are migrate inward to form the three germ layers. Okay? So which stage, if any, contains the neurula? The answer is none. So on the exam, if none is a valid choice, pick it. Okay? I'm not out to trick you. There might be none as a choice, OK? Um, put the stages in chronological order. Well, in this case, the first stage is B. That's the ovum. The next stage is A, the eight cell stage. Then D, the blastula. Then C, the gastrula. Okay. So when this used to be a timed exam, people would have to write in their answers. And then I would recommend, hey, write down A is eight cell, B is ovum, C is gastrula, D is the blastula. Because if you run out of time, when you did the second rotation, you could go back and try to figure it out. But it's much easier this way because you can spend as much time as you want on that question. Is that a question? No, just, okay. So, 
So the yoke plug is the yoke that's within inside that. Since we have an opening here on the surface, we've created that opening. You can look internally and see all that yoke. So the yoke plugs the massive yoke inside there, okay? The blastopore is the actual pore or opening, okay? All right. Um, so what does the summary of structure point out and see give rise to an chitin? So since this is the first opening, is a chitin a protostome or deuterostome? Protostome, it's the polyplacophorin, it's a molluscan, so that would be the mouth. And in the crinoidean, what group is that? It's within the echinoderm, so it's a deuterostome, so that first opening is the anus. And then generate a cladogram based upon the phylum that contains this, that's the chordata, and a chitin and crinoidean. So the chitin is the protostome. So that group, the phylum is mollusca. The smallest group that you had was polyplacophora. Uh, and then uh, it was a crinoidean. And uh, it was a sea daisy, but in terms of phylum, that's echinodermata. And then lastly, we had uh, the amphibian. So that's the chordata. And hopefully, students would realize it's an amphibian. Or if not, then vertebrata. We used to have a lab where we looked at all the various groups of the chordates. So if this was the current exam, we would probably accept either answer, with this being the more specific. But students may not realize that, because we didn't discuss it. But anyway, uh, does that make sense? But this is going to be a multiple choice exam, so you just pick out the answer that matches what it should be, OK? So, so we're going to have diagrams. It will not have the pins like this anymore. There will be images there. So if you look at the exam reader, I think you have three exams. All the exams that we've had in this format, I've given to you. First semester was fill in the blank. Second semester, spring 2013, was multiple choice. Summer 2013 was multiple choice. So I've given you every exam that I could give you. I'll give you one more on Wednesday night, OK? Um, best I can do, all right? Uh, anyway, when you look at the exam reader, they're in black and white. But realize for the exam that you take, a subset of the pages, probably eight pages of the 14-page exam, will be black and white. And six pages will be in color, which help you to identify various structures in that, OK? The reason why it's not all in color, it gets to be so expensive. It's about six or $7,000 to do everything in color, as is it's about $3,000, OK? So also, it adds another two to three more days to do more pages in color. So as is, it takes a week to photocopy it. Um, OK, so anyway, um, this detailed chart's the one that's on, Beast, on our website. It's outside the 2095, 2097. Uh, Ignore all the various groups of periphery. You'll find some things in here that we haven't covered. So if you're saying, gee, do we know, you know all these groups of periphery or the monogena for the platyhelamanthes, the answer is no. Okay? Again, sort of look to see what was covered in the lab manual and in the lecture. Cladograms, realize that a cladogram, the way you want to read this is read from the tips downward if you want the smallest group. So H is the smallest group that contains I and J. What's the smallest group that contains E and B? Sorry, yes, A. But I meant to say E and J. B, because we have to get a common branch point for E and J, so it would be here at B. But yeah, certainly if it's E and B, it would be A. Okay? That's why it's so useful to draw those cladograms out for yourself to know those. I've said from the very beginning that I would use this diagram here, and here's just with all the various group names added to give you a sense of this, right? And someone said, what do we need to know? And I said, pretty much all of it. We didn't look at brachiopoda or nemertians. But you know, for the chordates, again, we pretty much looked at the vertebrata, the tunicates, the urochordates, and the cephalochordates, the lancelet or amphioxus, and then various groups over here, OK? And notice, I want to point this out again for I don't know how many times, platyhelamentes are in the protostomes and they're in the branch of Lophochocosaurin. The uh, nematodes and arthropods are off there with the ecdysozoans. This was the thing here that sort of illustrated this for you. So the three Lophochocosaurins that we looked at, platy, mollusca, and annelids, 
and for the ectases of arthropods. Brief mention of the nematodes, and here's the deuterostomes here. Cnidarians here, which are not in the protostomes. They have radial symmetry, so this smallest clade is radiata. Here's bilateria. And to gain all these groups would be eumetazoa, and metazoans also include the periphera. Okay, so that's kind of what you'll need to know for the exam in terms of how that cladogram works or various cladograms work. Here's a more detailed one for the arthropods. And remember, this is pancrustacea here. I don't have that on the label. That's for the hexapoda and crustacea together. So that branch point there is the pancrustacea. Okay? All right, remember we're a tube within a tube. So everything within the GI tract is essentially outside the body, and we absorb nutrients across cell membranes to get uptake. Okay? Typically, the excretory system, once it enters this tube, it's outside the body, and we, again, selectively absorb or secrete into this tube things that are going to go out. And this excretory system is both nitrogenous waste and osmotic balance. In some groups, it's only osmotic balance, like the flatworms, because ammonia is free to diffuse across the surface. Any questions? I know I'm going relatively quick. At this point, you've studied, at least I hope. OK, you have. All right, various systems there. No sense to go over them, be familiar with them. In terms of mating, we know about asexual and sexual reproduction. This is, of course, an example of uh, uh, monoecious, where one organism, in terms of the species, contains both types of gonads, ovaries, and testes. And they're cross-fertilizing each other. They use the clitellum to secrete a glue that helps them stick together. And when they do this, there's a sperm groove that allows the, this worm to donate sperm to this one, and vice versa, this sperm to donate uh, gametes as well. Okay. In terms of gametogenesis, I think spermatogenesis is fairly straightforward, but the bottom line is we start off with spermatogonia. We generate more of them through mitosis so that once we males in this room reach puberty, we can continue to make uh, sperm throughout the rest of our lifetime, and we will make billions of them, OK? Um, so once we've done the S phase, we've changed the amount of DNA. So it's now 4C, still diploid. We've talked about this before. So this is called a primary spermatocyte. Once we do that first division, we end up with two spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes, they have about the same cell volume. So it's equal cytokinesis as opposed to oogenesis, where it's unequal. So we end up with two. Those are the secondary oocytes. We do the second division. Each of these yields two. And we're now down to the 1 and 1C. Those are spermatids. As they mature, they add the acrosomal head with the digestive enzymes, modify the mitochondria, add this flagella, et cetera, et cetera. Final maturation in the epididymis, where they're released upon ejaculation. Out the vas deferens, out the short ejaculatory duct, and then out the urethra, out the penis, OK? And then this just shows you an image of this. Remember, the Leydig cells, or interstitial cells, are between the tubules. This is one seminiferous tubule here. There's another one here not shown. But the interstitial cells out, out here, they convert cholesterol to what hormone? Testosterone. And then within here are the Sertoli cells that form those bridges, right? Those bridges are what forms the blood testy barrier. And as a result, when they're spermatids, they are in the lumen here. And the Sertoli cells convert testosterone to DHT, dihydroxytestosterone. And that's actually what is responsible for spermatogenesis, the direct hormone, OK? So any questions about this? Let's look at the slide. There's a tubule, tubule, tubule. Here's some of these interstitial cells here. So that's where the testosterone is being made. And if you look up close, this is where the spermatids are. You can see this long flagellum. It's not fully mature. That occurs in the epididymis. So out here in the periphery are where the spermatogonia are. And that's where they're being regenerated. So in here are the primary and secondary spermatocytes, and then it's the spermatids that cross that bridge into the lumen. All right? Oogenesis, I'm going to put some things on the board before we go over this image. I think it's helpful if I go back over this 
Remember, the entire structure, the uh, developing oogonia that's going to go through meiosis, and the follicular cells surrounding it all together is called a follicle. So what we'll see is as we go from an immature to mature follicle, we won't change the number here necessarily, but we will make lots and lots of these. So let's just start off with this as the oogonia. If we did a rat, it would go through what we just talked about, a primary oocyte, secondary oocyte, oatid, and an ovum, and it's unequal division. So in the end, we should end up with one large ovum per follicle that's developing. So I'm going to draw this here now. I'm going to draw it up on this board. This is a time course. So here's that oogonia, and there's going to be the zona pellucida around it and stuff. But there is a thin layer of follicular cells. That's immature. So during the maturation process, I'm going to increase the number of these and increase the number of them and increase the number of them. So it's getting bigger and bigger. The overall size of the follicle is increasing. Since it's these cells that produce the estrogen, you would expect the amount of estrogen to increase slowly during this part of the phase. Okay? And in fact, what happens is when we reach the point of ovulation, we have a layer, a couple layers of follicular cells that surround that ovum in the rat. And then we have a large fluid filled space up here called the antrum. We have another layer outside here. So this outer layer is called the fecal cells or fecal layer. And the inner one is a granulosa. But they're all follicular cells. Okay, they're still all follicular cells. The cells here are still follicular cells. Sometimes people call this the corona radiata. And then there's that zona pellucida outside, which is ex extracellular matrix. It is the fecal cells that are analogous to the Sertoli cells because they convert cholesterol to testosterone. Identical to what we saw with the sorry, with the Leydig cells. Identical to the Leydig cells or interstitial cells. And then it's the granulosa cells that convert testosterone to estrogen. Analogous to the Sertoli cells that converted testosterone not to estrogen, but to DHT. Okay? So this entire structure is getting bigger and bigger. Since we're making more and more of these cells, we would expect the level of estrogen to increase slightly pre-ovulation. Okay? So that's why the estrogen levels increase. This entire structure migrates to the surface of the ovary. This is fluid filled. It causes rupture. What gets released is this boxed portion here. That's what gets released. These cells here remain behind. And they change their metabolism such that they now make progesterone. So a unique hormone post-ovulation is progesterone. There may be small levels before, but it really increases afterwards. It is the progesterone that maintains the endometrium so that if fertilization has occurred and we go through the cleavage reactions, we can get implantation in that thick endometrium. The cells left behind form the structure called a corpus luteum, and that's what's produced in the progesterone. So this is what's unique to the post-ovulation. It has a lifespan of maybe two weeks in humans. So if there's no fertilization event, those corpus luteal cells die off. The progesterone decreases. The estrogen decreases. We reset the cycle. Okay? Um, unfortunately, Dr. Weisblatt will not have time to go over this in the 1A class, so that's about the level you need to know for the hormones. Okay? All right. But remember, there's associated changes in the line in the endometrium. 
If this was a human, it is a secondary oocyte that gets released, okay, as opposed to an ovum, okay? Any questions? Yes? Sure. So if you want, you can think about it from outer to inner. So the outer cells, in terms of the lumen of a tubule, are the, the interstitial cells. So that's these. Or sometimes called Leydig. So it is the Sertoli cells here that do that. Okay? So Sertoli cells are analogous to the uh, granulosa cells, and the interstitial or Leydig cells are analogous to the fecal cells. Okay? That help? Any other questions? Yes? Analogous. So the question is, what do I mean by analogous? And analogous means similar function. Okay. In this context, clearly these two that convert cholesterol to testosterone is doing the exact same function, right? And then this is converting testosterone to another hormone. This converts testosterone to another hormone. So that's why they're analogous. Okay. Yes. Yep. I hope I have an image of that. Okay, so realize here these are big structures, so sometimes we'll miss the corona radiata and that developing oogonia. Here is a uh, immature, but notice how this is pretty much solid packing. Here, if you notice, this is fluid filled. See how this layer here is much different than this? So this is the fecal layer outside here, and this is the granulosa layer there. Okay, is that showing up okay with the pointer? Do you even see the pointer? Okay, because the pointer, I'm trying to do that because it gets captured directly, so it's better quality. Yes? So the question is, are the granulosa cells called granulosa cells because they're packed with uh, granules? I don't know the basis of the, yeah, yeah. I mean, they do look like that, but I don't know if that's the basis of the naming system, okay? But it could be, I just don't know the basis of that naming system, okay? So here just shows you the time course, looking at the ovary. So we have a growing follicle, and then the corpus luteum left behind, and then the degenerating because it doesn't live for very long. And if it doesn't, if there's no implantation, then you just reset the cycle. Okay. And then here's this. Now this resolution is not high enough, but again, you see this outside layer here. That's the fecal granulosa. There's the oatid. If this was a rat, and that's what you looked at in terms of slides. Okay. The clear space is the zona pellucida, and then right here is that corona radiata, the layer going around, okay? And here's that corpus luteum that's left behind. Question? So the question is, what's the function of the antrum? I suspect what's happening is we have a cavity there, and so by building up the fluid, as that fluid pressure increases, I don't know if it's sensed by the ovary and therefore it tends to migrate towards the surface, but what you could potentially imagine is as this fluid builds up here, it could sever this kind of connection here. So this oatid and the surrounding corona radiata would kind of be free in the antrum so that when it does rupture, it's free to eject it outside away from the ovary. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so this is just showing you unfertilized eggs. So remember, the membrane potential here is negative. Sure. Okay, so let me just go over the various layers. Outside, so the entire thing is the ovary. We're looking at just one mature follicle here. Okay, but the entire thing is the ovary focused on one mature follicle. Outside this layer there, how you see that darker line? That's the fecal layer there. Here is the granulosa layer there. All this space here is the antrum. Here are the cells, the granulosa cells, that surround the oatid. So that's the corona radiata. There's the actual ovum. And there's the extracellular matrix called zona pellucida. So the question is, the zona radiata, corona radiata, is that made up of granulosa cells? Yes. 
because these cells here just come right around like this, okay? Right? The reason why it's been given a special name is because when this gets released, the cells are with it, okay? All right, so let's go back to this. In terms of gametogenesis here, unfertilized here, but they have a negative membrane potential. What happens is, as part of the maturation process in the ovary of that sea urchin, okay, what's the group for the urchins? Echinodermata echinoidea is the smaller class. So within here, we have a preformed materials as part of the maturation. So there are all these granules, vesicles out there in the cortex, ready to do something once they get the appropriate signals to do that. Okay? So what happens here is, let's say a sperm comes through, goes through the jelly coat. We don't see the jelly coat because it's the same index of refraction as the mountain medium, the seawater. So you don't see it. There are some species where there are pigment granules in the jelly coat, and then you can see the jelly coat. You just don't see that here, okay? Anyway, the sperm has to get through the jelly coat and then do the fertilization. And when it does that, we get a fast block. The membrane fusion of the sperm and the egg causes the membrane potential to change dramatically from a minus to a plus. That alters all the protein conformation on that membrane, including the sperm receptors. So another sperm can't bind because that receptor looks nothing like it did before. But ultimately, that would be lethal if you did that for too long because all of the transport proteins, everything there has changed shape. So what happens is the fast block can't be maintained for very long. So what we do is a slow block. And I'll show you an image of this shortly where we form this fertilization envelope, sometimes called a membrane. We literally separate the vitellin layer from it. And it becomes very hard such that additional sperm just can't get through it. Okay. And then this just shows you the cleavage reactions. Here we start the gastrulation. So what's this opening there? Blastopore. What are we forming here? So that's going to be the anus eventually. We're forming the primitive gut, the archenteron, and we're forming the three germ layers. And then this just shows you a larval form where it has bilateral symmetry, but the adults have radio. Okay. Here's the time course here. So realize this is a time course. Left to right as you view it, time course. So here's the sperm. The, let's ignore the sperm for now. Before this occurred, the sperm were even present. We had the jelly coat. We had the egg membrane. We have these preformed granules there. We had the vitellin layer here and those sperm receptors, species specific. So what happens is sperm comes on, starts to digest through the jelly coat using the acrosome. Receptor interaction, so there's species recognition. The membranes touch. That causes this change in membrane potential to go from minus to plus. One aspect of that is sodium comes rushing in. So sodium is much higher concentration outside than inside. What causes that change in sodium? Why is sodium so low inside the egg? What protein is responsible? Protein. What protein is responsible? For the very low levels of sodium within the cell. Sodium potassium pump, right? Dr. Weisblatt's talked a lot about that, how you pump three sodiums out and two potassiums in. So sodium is much higher outside. So that what you do is, in response to this, you open the sodium gates, sodium comes rushing in, and in response to that sodium, the ER releases calcium that it has stored. And then the calcium causes the triggers of the fusion of these vesicles here, so they fuse with the membrane. So if you looked at a vesicle like this, so if this is the membrane, each layer of that phospholipid is color-coded, and X is what's ever inside that, you'll see that With time, you get that. So the white membranes fuse. Then you can imagine the yellow in terms of the layers, so that what was inside that is now dumped to the outside. So now that is being dumped into the space right underneath the vitellin layer. And that's what causes the vitellin layer to separate. And that's what we call the fertilization envelope or membrane, OK? Not truly a membrane, 
if you would call it that, so fertilization envelope. It's that space there, okay? Any questions about that? And that prevents polyspermy, so you can reset the membrane potential to what it was before, and all those transport proteins, et cetera, can function normally. This is for the frog. We started the lecture with this. Ovum, eight cell, blastula. And in this case, we have a holoblastic cleavage, which means the first few divisions cleave the entire amount of yolk. And we, of course, have to look at that with the vertical cleavage, not horizontals, okay? So that's holoblastic. Miroblastic would mean just a small part of it, okay? And during gastrulation, those three germ layers are forming. And during neurulation, organogenesis, we have this layer here in terms of the epithelium cell. What germ layer produces this? Ecto, endo, or meso? Ectoderm, right? Because it's the outside surface. So now you can see why the, the ectoderm that gives rise to the nervous system, because as you get this involution, there's the nervous system now, right? And that's all those cells that used to be on the surface. So that's why it's the ectoderm that gives rise to the nervous system. Okay? And then this is just an illustration of the neural stage here. That's the anterior end, posterior end here, because that's where the head will be. It's bigger space because of that increased cephalization. All right? This is just going over what we did earlier in terms of the uh, release of gametes. So we would have sperm released from the epididymis through the vas deferens, coils around the the bladder there, there's a short ejectory duct. Other <coughs> glands dump their secretions out the urethra, out the tip of the penis, and this just shows you a side view. In the rat, in terms of structures here, seminal vesicle here. Do you want to go back and go over that? Okay. Okay. So the problem is we only have 80 minutes, and the department wants me to make lectures only 50. So, yeah, what? That's what I said too. Anyway. Epididymis here, that's where the sperm matured. They were producing the tubules. All those tubules coalesce into the epididymis. All right. Upon ejaculation, the epididymis has uh, muscular walls that causes contraction, which expels a volume of sperm out. The vas deferens is also contractile. And you can imagine that it's coordinated, so you contract from this end towards this end so that you force the sperm in a one-way direction. Continue down the vas deferens. Then it comes back around here, which in the side view, you can sort of see coming around here and then down. So as these other glands empty, it's called the ejaculatory duct. It's quite short. So it goes into the urethra, which is surrounded by the prostate, and then out the penis. Question? So the question was, before ejaculation, those sperm are in the epididymis maturing, right? And there's some residual sperm left in the vas deferens from the previous ejaculation in that. So, and also in the ejaculatory duct and possibly the urethra. If the person's, uh, you know, if the male's, you know, urinated a few times, then there'll be fewer sperm left in the urethra. Uh, but, you know, before ejaculation, there's secretions called pre-cum in terms of like lubricants and that. So there can be sperm in there. So you can get pregnant, female can get pregnant, I should say, from pre-cum because sperm can be there as well. The number of sperm is much lower than in the ejaculate, but it's possible, okay? So other questions? Okay, um, so here's the actual seminal vesicle here, which is producing the, what? The fructose, the sugars. So sperm use fructose as a specialized sugar because they don't have to worry about competition for other with other organisms in the vagina, the uterus, because they're also taking up those sugars as well, right? So fructose is kind of unique. They have specialized fructose receptors on the sperm. Okay, so there's a seminal vesicle at the base of this, the coagulant gland. So the viscosity of the semen changes. You want it to be really thick when you ejaculate, so you can shoot it further, so the sperm have shorter distance to swim. But if it stays too viscous, then the sperm can't swim, so it will become really liquid later, okay? Yes? Sure. Yeah. So again, the seminal vesicle is the white part here with these little ridges on the outside here. So the Kragen gland is here at the base, the dark structure, and here at the base. Okay. All right. Here's the prostate. This bladder is filled 
So the urethra goes from the bladder out through the penis, okay? And then here, of course, is the testes epididymis here, and this is the vas deferens, this tube right there, okay? So when they do a vasectomy, they cut the vas deferens, staple the ends shut so the sperm can't be released. The male still ejaculates, there's still secretions with seminal vesicle, the you know, prostate gland just shouldn't contain sperm. Then this just shows you the penis here, pulled out, okay? And there's some glands here called perpucial glands that produce a must smell, which is how they know sex of them. Um, okay, so here's the female. This is from a human. So I just want to point out a few things. In terms of differences between rats and humans. In humans, here's the uterus here, cervix, vagina. So if a woman's using a diaphragm, she covers the cervix so that sperm can't get in the uterus. And normally, so the distal end, relative to the vagina, that opening, the distal end here just gets thinner and thinner and thinner. That's the oviduct, okay? Also called fallopian tube. We use the terms interchangeably. So here's the ovary here. So when this human female ovulates, she releases secondary oocytes. They're released from the surface into the abdominal cavity. So the oviduct has distal ends called fimbriae. They're kind of like fingers. And if my fist is the ovary, you know, if I go like this, that's the oocyte that was released. This kind of sweeps over the surface. So it's checking for that bulge, OK? But nonetheless, it gets released in the abdominal cavity. But because there are cilia here, they create a suction, basically, that pulls that in, hopefully, into the oviduct. And then the sperm have to swim up against that, OK? So it's a tough journey. Okay, yes, so I was, so the question is, can I go over oviduct and fallopian tube? Um, those terms will be used interchangeably by ourselves, so there is no difference. We use those terms interchangeably. Uterus is this structure here. Uterine horn is in the rat, so let's go over that. So if this is the uterus here, as it branches distally to form the oviduct or fallopian tube, in the rat, because they have so many uh, embryos implanted, they can implant in the uterine horns. So instead of this being a narrow diameter, in a rat, it's quite large as well, okay? So in a rat like this, here's the uterus down here. That's called the body of the uterus, and these are uterine horns. In a human, you wouldn't find uterine horns like this. It would just be thin and narrow, and it would be all called the oviductor fallopian tube. Did that help? Okay. Uh, so here's the ovary here, the red mass. One reason why it's red is because there are those maturing follicles on the surface, and it's highly vascularized. I don't know if you can see this, but if you were to look carefully, here's the uterine horn, uterus down here. The sperm have to swim up here. And then these small white coils, that's the fallopian tube or oviduct. So fertilization in a human, I don't know about a rat, but probably similar, typically occurs in the upper third of the oviduct as that secondary oocyte's traveling down. The sperm swim up there. Fertilization occurs, and as it then goes through the cleavage reaction, it's being pulled down by the cilia action, and then hopefully by the time it gets to the uterus here and the lining of the endometrium, it's reached the blastocyst stage so it, it can implant. So there is only about a window of maybe 72 hours where maybe, if you want to be safe, maybe four or five days at most, where you're going to be successful for fertilization and then implantation. Here just shows you the uterine horns. You can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that's why you need that real estate, the area, to implant those, okay? And then here just shows you the embryo with the placenta, the umbilical cord, and this still has the amniotic sac surrounding it. So when a woman's water bursts, whatever, it's the amniotic sac has ruptured. Now the fetus is no longer cushioned or bathed by that amniotic fluid. And here's the placenta, quite large. And then here's just a diagram illustrating that. In terms of the crustaceans, in the female, male, male has these modified swimmerettes to transfer sperm. Females will release their eggs at the base of the second pair of walking legs. And what happens is she will get packets of sperm from the male. She'll store those. Then as she releases her eggs, they get fertilized. She will take her abdomen and basically fold it over. 
And what that does then is by folding over like this with the swimmerettes, it positions the swimmerettes near the base of the walking legs so that as she releases those, we hope, fertilized eggs, they'll glue, be glued to the swimmerettes. So they'll be attached to the swimmerettes like this, and that's where they go through the cleavage reactions, and then the young will emerge. Okay? Questions? All right. So here just shows you, in terms of the earthworm, seminal vesicles, both testes and ovaries within here. Okay? So monoecious, out here are the spermatheca or sperm receptacles. That's where it stores sperm it received. Okay? In terms of the cockroach, so female here, ovario, ovary with its subdivisions. Uh, here's the accessory gland. Okay? On the male, the accessory gland, the white coils are clumped together. It reminds me of a mop head. Now, what is the function of this? It's an accessory gland. It's not producing the gametes. It has some other function. So it would be analogous to something like the seminal vesicle or Kragen gland or prostate. Okay? That's the analogous structure. The analogous structure in this is the ovary to the ovary and testes to testes. Testes are kind of hard to find, but there's another structure that is easy to see. It can globate. Again, accessory. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? Uh, can I point to the ovary? The ovary is this entire structure here. The subdivisions are called ovarioles. Okay? But the entire structure here is the ovary. Entire structure here is ov ovary. And these are just subdivisions are called ovarioles. Okay? Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, which have external okay. so the question is which have external and internal fertilization? So external is away from the surface. So that's going to have to be an aquatic organism because you typically need to have that moist environment for the sperm to, to swim in, okay? So if it's terrestrial, it's almost, almost always internal. Internal being defined as within a cavity formed by the body. Very few things have true, true internal fertilization, which means it crosses a membrane before it gets there. There are some insects where the male will come up to the female, and if they, if they don't even know if it's a male or a female, they just inject. And they'll take basically like a needle, and they'll just inject it through the body wall of the other insect and shoot sperm in there. Now, that's true internal fertilization, okay? Because they've punctured membranes and stuff. Very few things have that. We call internal in terms of reproduction something that occurs within the body in terms of a cavity, okay? So the same is true for humans. The sperm are free to swim up there. They haven't crossed a membrane until they reach the egg, right? So that's technically external, but we all call it internal because it's within a surface of the body. Okay? Is that okay? All right. So here's the chicken egg. I'm sure everyone's seen this. Uh, did er anyone watch Amazing Race on Sunday night? Okay, never mind. We won't go there. Anyway, <laughs> chick egg here. Small amount of cytoplasm there. That's where all those cleavage reactions will be occurring. So this is clearly miroblastic cleavage. And what we'll form is this sort of thing where we have some layers and the cells migrate inward. So the primitive streak is analogous to the blastopore because that's where the cells migrate inward to form the three germ layers. Okay? And the three germ layers, again, endo, ecto, and meso. Here shows you the egg. I know I'm going relatively fast because um, I'm trying to get through. We haven't even done reproduction development, and we have 36 minutes left. Okay, so ask questions if you have them, you know, as necessary. I'm not discouraging them by any means. So four membranes outside of the embryo, so they're called extra embryonic membranes. So we have the embryo proper. We can see the vertebral column forming. That's Illustrative of segmentation. So each of our vertebra represents segment. So we are segmented animals. Okay? So we have the amniotic membrane that creates the amniotic sac to the amniotic fluid. Because these things are developing in the chick egg, we have to have some place to put the waste. So they have an allantoic membrane that creates a sac called the allantois, where nitrosous wastes are being pumped. What form? Ammonia, urea, or uric acid? Uric acid, because that's the one that requires the least amount of water. And then outside of this, we have a yolk sac. Yolk sac is 
going around the yolk. So that's our source of nutrients, right? So the yolk is a lot of sugars, things like that. Um, that's why it's okay to, um, and also some cholesterol in there, some fats. The white part, the albumin, is mostly proteins. So this yolk sac does indeed go over the egg white as well, eventually, to get the proteins from there. So that's the yolk sac, and then outside all of that is the chorion. Okay? So those are the four membranes outside. The ones you can see clearly, allantois and the amniotic, although not real clear here, that surrounds the embryo. The chorion is hard to see, and the yolk sac, because it goes around the yolk, when you remove this embryo and clean it up, it's no longer present. When you first clean, before cleaning it up, you probably ripped part of that yolk sac, the membrane, and took it with it, okay? But you cleaned it up to see this here. This just shows you a slide. This is the dorsal hollow nerve cord. That's the notochord there. Just know the various layers. Again, think about endo, GI tract and outpocketings, mesoderm, mostly skeletal muscle, and ectoderm, epithelial surfaces, and the nervous system. Okay. Now, I should clarify that when I say epithelial, I mean outside surfaces, inside surfaces, line of that. Now, what lines the uh, coelom in a true coelom organism? Peritoneum, but what's it derived by? Mesoderm there, okay? Um, and that just goes over that. Be familiar with protostomes versus deuterostomes in terms of cleavage. Deuterostomes radial, the cells line up right over one another in contrast to spiral. The way the coelom is formed, out pocketing here, that's the red. Uh, splitting here, schizocelus. And then the first opening is the mouth and protostomes, first opening is the anus and deuterostomes. And then we've gone over the coelom. In terms of the hydra, be familiar with gastrovascular cavities. How many germ layers? So which one gave rise to the gastroderm? Endoderm, which one gave rise to the epidermis? Ectoderm, doesn't have mesoderm. There is some mesoglia, extracellular matrix between this. In the jellyfish, it's really thick. Okay? Also, the platyhelminthes have a gastrovascular cavity, but they have three germ layers there. Yes, the question is, there was a question in the lab manual as you work through the lab is, are the tentacles hollow, hollow? So if you look here, they are indeed hollow because what happens is the way the nutrients are being distributed is by basically moving that gastrovascular, the fluid within the gastrovascular cavity around. So if they weren't hollow, the distance to transport those nutrients would be too great. So that's why they're hollow. Okay, It's reflective of the fact that if you have to diffuse too far, it takes too long. Okay. Um, just know the various classes, uh, various things like that. Polyp versus Medusa, the various things like this. I'm not going to spend much time on various figures like this. They're clearly labeled in the lab manual. I've been asked, will I have diagrams like this on the lab exam, and then have you bubble in A, B, C, D, or E that corresponds to the diagram? Typically, the answer is no. I'm usually going to actually use actual images slides, et cetera, instead of the diagrams. The diagrams were to help you identify on the actual material. So for the exam, I'm going to have the actual material, OK? Um, here's just that. A few things I want to point out. The nidocytes are the specialized cells in cnidarians, and they have the organelles within them, the nematocysts. Nudibranchs, when they feed upon cnidarians, they actually ingest these nidocytes and they incorporate them in the body, their body wall. They don't make them, but they incorporate them, okay? So it's their defense and the naked snails, the nudibranchs. This one? Okay. So, so. So the question or comment is, if there are no testes and ovaries present and only budding, then if the question is what form of sexual reproduction is being illustrated, then it would strictly be asexual. If the ovaries and testes are present plus budding, then you'd say both. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then what if there's no Just testes and ovaries, then you'd only be seeing sexual. So the comment is, 
if there were only testes and no ovaries, would you still call it sexual? Yes, because it could be a, a species that potentially was dioecious. Okay? But in that case, you would still call it sexual because you have some gonads being present. You wouldn't say half sexual if you see only ovaries or only testes. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, Platyhelminthes, remember there's some cephalization there. Here's this. I want to point out this cavity here is not a coelom. It's a pharyngeal cavity. It allows that pharynx to go in and out of the organism, right? The distal end's the mouth. Where uh, distal end, you suck food in, right? Um, yes. And then over there, yeah. Okay. So, so the question is the turbellarians like planaria. Uh, most pl planarians are free living. They're not parasitic. So in fact, uh, you know, I used to go capture these in streams. So most turbellarians are free living. There may be one or two examples that are parasitic, but as a group we consider them to be mostly free living. Okay? Not symbiotic because, I mean, maybe there are some things living on their surface that might be considered to be symbiotic because they're bacteria that we don't see, but we wouldn't typically call them symbiotic, just like we probably wouldn't call the bacteria living in our armpits symbiotic, right? But we have lots of bacteria there. They live there. They, help, they actually help protect us, though, right? So in fact, if you have abnormal populations of flora, you have health issues, OK? So there are issues with fecal transplants and things like that to change that. Yes? Yeah, that's right. Uh, because food can enter and, and exit without ever crossing a membrane. It's just like our mouth. Yeah, our mouth is not a coelom. We can take a lollipop in and out, but we've never crossed a membrane. Food can enter the GBC, and if it wants to spit it out, it goes right out. Okay? Question in the very back. Sure, sure. So let me put a, di a drawing on the board that may help. Okay, so here's the pharynx. That's the opening there. This is, has a lumen, a cavity, that allows that to go in and out of the body. So if you look at that from the side, like this, the pharynx would come out like this, and that's the opening. So as food enters, it enters the lumen. So if I looked at just section A, I would see this. And this is the lumen here. Okay? If I looked at B, where the pharynx is within the cavity, I would see the body wall. I would have a cavity, and then I would have the actual pharynx, and then the lumen would be here. Because this cavity here, so this is the cells of the pharynx, and I'll show you this on the slide, this cavity here allows this to go in and out. So you can imagine when I put my arm in a jacket sleeve and I did not bring a jacket, I have to have the lumen of the jacket to allow my arm to go in and out, right? So that's the same thing here. So if you look at the slide now, here's the body here, the outside body wall. Here's the cavity. So this space here is a pharyngeal cavity. So this entire structure here, these are the cells, are, is the pharynx. And then there's a the lumen, the internal part of the pharynx. And that leads anteriorly. So it would branch. Um, I don't want to use yellow. We would branch anterior and then posterior, like this. And then sort of out pocketings like this, 
so that we minimize the distance that the food has to diffuse out of, the nutrients out of, into those body cells because there's no circulatory system. Did that help? Yeah? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's a common question. Um, in terms of the annelids, remember our landmarks, dorsal blood vessel, uh, slide like this showing you the various things. Uh, I do want to point out that there's a large coelom. What type of circulatory system, open or closed? Closed, excellent. What type of respiratory pigment? Hemoglobin, it's red. That's just dissolved in the blood, it's not within the red blood cells. Here's uh, this. Now on the lab exam, what we typically try to do, you know, and realize 650 people are looking at this, and you're never going to please every student of the 650, we do our best. But what we try to do is have a large image like this, and as necessary, we try to put an inset next to it of a magnified image from the same image, okay? So that in case it may not be really clear and we're looking at a very small structure, we'll have a magnified image over here so you can see it more clearly, okay? So when we say there's an inset or something like that, what we've done is taken a small part of that larger image and blown it up and set it just slightly near there. Is that clear? And that's to help you see it in more detail, okay? It's not meant to confuse you. It's to help you to see it in more detail as necessary, okay? Um, so here as we go through the GI tract, we have the pharynx, the esophagus coming down to the crop, gizzards, the intestine here and out. I don't know if you can see that small white line there. That's the ventral nerve cord. You know what? It shows up much better by me looking up here than on my small monitor. Uh, but what's this here? The blood vessel. Here's the dorsal blood vessel. It bends around here. So that's the ventral blood vessel. Okay. Uh, seminal vesicles here. These are the spermatheca or seminal receptacles there. And the calciferous glands are those four yellow structures there. Pair, pair. Okay. And they relate calcium. Yes? Sure. So the question is, can I go over the ventral nerve cord versus the blood vessels? So in this case, since the blood vessels have the hemoglobin in them, they should appear red. So that's the easiest way to tell a blood vessel. So this is the dorsal blood vessel. These are the pseudohearts. So I can't see this too well. Dorsal blood vessel comes here. Then it's on top of this, and then it kind of isn't visible here. But the ventral blood vessel is visible here, okay? You can't see the ventral here because it's hidden by all this tissue, okay? And then the ventral nerve cord is this white line right there. That's the ventral nerve cord. Question? There are no actual hearts per se. It's the pseudo hearts. And what happens is both the dorsal and blood vessel contract. And as they contract, they pump blood. But it turns out, and then if I have a blood vessel like this, that's ventral, and I have one that's dorsal, I have vessels that go around the circumference that allows transfer from the dorsal to the ventral. Okay? And it just so happens that the dorsal blood vessel contracts more than the ventral, and even about seven of these that go around the circumference up in the anterior end contract the most. So that's why they're called pseudo hearts because that's where the vast majority of the pumping is occurring. Okay? Does that make sense? Whoever asked the question? Um, okay. So let's move on. Here just shows a close up of this uh, gizzard here, highly muscularized. The crop is here, it's been ruptured. I would not use this image and say, what was this, okay? And expect you to know that the crop used to be there. I wouldn't do that, okay? Uh, here's the intestine here. What vessel is this? Dorsal blood vessel. What's this yellow tissue? Chlorogenous tissues. Here's a close-up here. So on the lab exam, if, if I didn't think the suprapharyngeal ganglia were clear enough at this magnification, I would take and have an inset, round inset or whatever, and they would make it larger so you could see that those were the suprapharyngeal ganglia. So we would have a label on the small image as well as on the inset. Okay? Does that make sense? Again, to try to really help you make sure you can identify it. Okay? Uh, that doesn't mean, I mean, we try to make it as clear as possible. Okay? Uh, this is the pharynx here. Notice all these attachments to generate the force because you're pulling food in and goes through the esophagus and down. Here shows you another close-up here. 
Here's those pseudo hearts. These are actively pumping. Here's those calciferous glands, close up of the seminal vesicles, and there's the spermatheca there. And this is a body wall here, the septum, like the septum of your nose. It separates the very somites or segments. The septum does. The metanephridia are these white structures out here that float, and they're red, and they're red because they have capillary beds. Because as the metanephridia takes up ions in solution, you need to redistribute it back into the circulatory system, so you have capillary beds there. It's like the vasa recta of a kidney. I would not ask you, is this analogous to the vasa recta, but if you want to make analogies to 1A, that would be an analogy there. Okay? This is the intestine, cut open, so you can see all the stuff that's in there. Infolding of the typhosol to increase the surface area, which you can see here in the slide. Okay. Now, what vessel is this? Dorsal. And what's these sort of things cut off here to the side? Could be potentially pseudo hearts, but it's the vessels that go around the circumference. And remember, since this is a section and these things can be wherever, we may catch only slightly part of it, right? Yeah? Because um, you can imagine, you know, if you do a section of me when I'm slightly not perfectly positioned, what you get would be very different each time. So here's the typhosol. So what's this here? Lumen of the intestine. Okay. Epithelium here. These are the circular muscles that go around the circumference and the longitudinal here and here. Circular muscles are real easy to identify. Longitudinal, much more difficult in this section. Here just shows you this, so let's just quick do, what's A? Lumen of the intestine, what's B? One of those citae sticking out. What's C? Circular muscle that goes around. What's D? Longitudinal, what's E? It's a metanephridia, it's actually the opening of it, the nephrostome, the actual opening. So what gets pulled into it? What type of fluid? Interstitial or salomic fluid, right? Because all this space here, F, is what? Coelom. So all this space is coelom, so it's salomic fluid that enters. Once it's inside that tube, it's effectively outside the body and acted upon. Okay? So we're in the mollusks, know the various groups. Uh, here's this. Let's go through a few structures. We have 17 minutes. Okay. What's A? Mantle edge. So what's all this cavity here? Mantle cavity. That's what I tried to illustrate by E, trying to show you this space in here. So when this is filter feeding, the shell closes up using what muscles? Adductor. They add to midline, closing the shell. So the mantle cavity is now closed, so it's watertight. But since the cilia here on the tenidia create a current, they suck water in through this tube here, C, which is what? In current siphon. So remember, in current leads to, to the mantle. Okay? And X current's behind it, dorsal, we don't see it. It's there, we just don't see it. So fluid enters, so B is the shell, of course, of the valve. C is the in current siphon. D is the tenidia. E is the mantle space. F is visceral mass. What's G? Foot. Uh, kind of hard to tell H, but it's supposed to be the um, labial palps. Can't really see it, so. I wouldn't normally ask you that from this image because it's not clear enough. And what's I? That's the adductor muscle. Is it anterior or posterior? Anterior. Anterior because the foot is here, moved here. So are we looking from the ventral view or dorsal? Ventral. Okay. Here's a dorsal view. We've cut the X current siphon, so normally we would not be able to see these structures. We have a window inside. Here's the anus, C. So wastes are dumped into the X current siphon. Okay. So D is trying to illustrate the space, the lumen of the X current siphon. B is the heart. A over here is the elastic hinge. Okay. All right. Any questions? I see some hands up, but I can't tell if they're questions or pointing at structures. Yes. Sure. Okay. So. The siphon is here, it's folded over, but the siphon would extend out in this direction, okay? Is that clear? Since the siphon is posterior, 
that makes the, uh, I got to look at wait, your orientation. To your left is anterior, okay? So that makes that anterior and makes this posterior. So the clam would be moving this direction. So the clam is like this. Sorry, I will try it. Here's the clam. <laughs> moving, okay? And that's the right side. So this is the right side, that's the left. You don't want me to do that again, do you? Good, okay. All right, are we okay? Yeah. So, so what we've done is we've cut the X current siphon so you can see inside the lumen of it. In current, so, so let me make a drawing of this. It's a little confusing. So there's the foot. That makes this anterior. This is posterior. The siphon sticks out like this. The siphon itself has both the in current and x current. So this is the in current. This is the x current. So I'm going to redraw this because it's probably not large enough to see in the back. That hopefully is. So the in current is ventral. The x current is dorsal. And what we've done is then this gets hidden into the visceral mass. What we've done in a cross section, it would look just like this, where we'd see that lumen, that lumen. What we've done is we've cut this here, we made a slit in it, and then that allowed it to separate so we can see inside here now. Okay? So what we're seeing inside is the heart there, here, the bright orange structure, and the anus here. So you're dumping the waste downstream. So uh, in the lab exam, one of them, I asked some question and say, would you find gametes here or whatever? Uh, and I think it was pointed to the in-current siphon. And ideally, this organism does not dump its own gametes into the in-current siphon because it would then filter them out on the tenidia and they'd never get outside for fertilization, OK? What's E? E is the entire siphon itself, OK? D is the space within it, OK? Other questions? Okay, let's, yes. How do you determine the sex of a clam? Is that the question? Uh, you didn't have to know the sex of them, okay? But they typically have separate genders for the bivalves, okay? There are gonads within the visceral mass. Uh, if you saw eggs, what gender would it be? What sex? Females, okay? That, that's what you do, okay? Um, for the echinoderms, the various groups there, you know the various charts. Realize we have oral and aboral because we have radial symmetry. Um, here just shows the internal anatomy. Remember, in terms of the digestive system, let's take a walk through the digestive system. Food enters the mouth. We have the cardiac stomach closest to the mouth. It actually gets everted out. If you see a starfish feeding, the marine tank works well for this because it's glass and you can see through it. So if the starfish is feeding, you see that stomach come out and it goes over, let's say we give it to the shrimp, and sort of takes the mass over the shrimp and starts to break it up, digest it, and sucks it in. That food then gets transferred from the cardiac stomach closest to the mouth into the pyloric stomach, then funnels the food out to the digestive cecca slash hepatic slash pyloric. All three names, exact same structure. Digestive, hepatic, pyloric. All three same, same, same. What they mean is digestive, most digestion occurs there, the breakdowns occur in there, and the nutrients freely diffuse into the coelomic fluid. That's there in that large coelom. So then we just have to somehow move that coelomic fluid around, and the water vascular system helps to do that. Okay? That's why it's called vascular. Um, okay? The other thing is called pyloric. I like that name because the pyloric cica are connected to the pyloric stomach. So if you're having trouble identifying which stomach it is, is it connected to the pyloric cecum? If so, it is the pyloric stomach. And then hepatic means liver-like, so glycogen storage, detoxification, formation of nitrogenous waste. In this case, all echinoderm are marine, osmoconformers, so what form of nitrogenous waste? Ammonia. Okay. And then 
the food goes out the short intestine, sorry, the waste go out the short intestine, out the anus, and out pockets from this are called rectal ceca. I do not know the function of them, and you do not need to know the function of the rectal ceca. But something in the digestive system, okay? All right, yes? So, so, so most of the digestion in terms of the molecular digestion occurs here in the digestive ceca. So what happens is we're looking at a top view. Here's one of those digestive ceca. So as the nutrients are broken down, they get pumped into here. I shouldn't say pump, but they get... Uh, carriers that do it, and then now it's in the salomic fluid. So the vast majority of the digestion is actually occurring here, and then the nutrients just diffuse here because we have to feed those cells of the skeleton because this is a living endoskeleton. We have to feed the epithelium, various things like that, so those nutrients fuse here. And then the salomic fluid just gets moved around. Okay, Does that make sense? All right, in terms of the water vascular system, it's here. Um, now, realize that the radial canals that go out the radius and the lateral and the ring canal are all buried within the endoskeleton. So they're really hard to see, but you can infer their presence, okay? All right, if you want to think of this, think of the bone marrow. The bone marrow is inside the bone. So you don't see the bone marrow, but you can see the bone. Um, this is not bone, I'm just using an analogy, okay? So they do have the endoskeleton, and it protects those canals. What you can see is the major porite, which is on the aboral surface. Okay, so in this structure, whoops, you don't see that. Let me go forward. Here is the major porite B. That would lead internally to the stone canal, which goes from the oral aboral surface to the ring canal, which is in the endoskeleton, and then out the radius of each arm, and then laterally to the ampulla and the tube feet. A is supposed to be illustrating a spine that projects upward. But there's epithelium on it, so it's an endoskeleton. So a student asked during office hours, how can I tell pedicillary versus the spines versus the dermal branchia? They look very different when you see them magnified with a microscope. The pedicillaries look like those pincher-like structures. They look a lot like Pac-Man sort of thing. Hopefully your TA did the demo. When they're closed, they look like this. When they're open, they look like that. I asked them to take a little fine dissecting pin. They take that fine dissecting pin and put it in there. It clamps shut, and you'd see the pin stuck like that. Okay? So hopefully your GSI or UGSI did that demo. So those are the pedicillary, very obvious to see. The spines are the endoskeleton projecting up, and then covered by epithelium. And they're usually white, and they are hardened. The dermal branchia tend to be clumped, and they're very soft looking, and they're kind of a brownish color, okay? So just look at some images. I don't know if I have any magnified images. I do here a little bit. See here, those are all those dermal branchia. You don't actually see spines sticking up here, so I would not ask you to identify spines here because you really don't see them, okay? Um, and here is tube feet. Is there a question? Okay. And then here just shows you the tube feet and the spines, and then here's those dermal branchia here. And these are the spines. They look very different. Pedicillary, too small to see with this magnification. If I wanted you to identify pedicillary from this image, I'd have to have an inset that shows you a close-up. Okay. What is A? B? Oh. A B as in boy or, or, or D as in dog. Okay. B? It just shows you sort of, the, it's, it's the epithelium here, trying to stress that it's a, it has an endoskeleton. B as in boy is a modified tube feed out here, which is sensory, and actually has some light reception. So they're sometimes called tentacles, but they're just modified tube feet. So if you notice here, they look different here. They're a little bit highly specialized, okay? Um, so here, we're looking from which surface, oral or aboral? Oral. That's the mouth there. That's what D is supposed to indicate. Here's supposed to be the tube feet here. 
Here's spines, but they're modified. Here we do see that they're not as modified. Why would these spines here be modified? What function might they help serve? Protect the tube feet. Yep. And then A is just supposed to, again, show the ampulla. Or you might want to call this the ambulacral groove, the entire thing. So that's why A, you know, when we had fill in, we'd have to accept either tube feet or ambulacral groove because you don't know without any other information, right? Uh, C, since it's kind of like this, kind of implies it might be the, the groove, but again, not as clear as it could be. Okay, other questions? All right, here just shows you what stomach is B. Okay, do you see the pyloric cica? No, so is it the pyloric stomach? No, so what stomach is it? Cardiac. Great. And gonads, and this is a female and a male white. Okay. Here's the ambulacral ridge. Here's all these ampulla inside in this huge coelom. Okay. Uh, here's the cardiac stomach. Here's the digestive cecum out here. Here shows you again what stomach is this? Do you see the pyloric cecum? No. So it's the cardiac stomach. Here's the stone canal right here. We can't see the major porite because that went off with the aboral surface when we removed it, right? But you can see the endoskeleton. All these are those calcareous plates that overlap. Here's the ambulacral ridge. The radial canal is in, within here, buried, protected, and it leads right radially here to these ampulla. So radially here, out to the ampulla. We can't see them because they're, again, protected. Gonads are very small here, right here, and they're paired within each arm. Okay, question. Okay, so in this case, so here we see the pyloric cica, okay, but we don't see it connected to the pyloric stomach anymore because you would, let's see if I have another image of this. Right here. See how there's this direct connection here to the stomach. Over here, you don't see that connection anymore because it's been severed. It's been taken off with the other part. So for the pyloric stomach, you will see that connection to the pyloric cica. Okay? All right. Back to this. Uh, we did the stone canal here, a close-up of this. That's the Basically, we're looking down at the mouth, practically, because that stomach just gets pushed out, everted past that opening. Here shows you the pyloric stomach. Can't really see the intestines so short, but here's those rectal cica, B as in boy, branching outward. Here's the digestive cica slash hepatic slash pyloric. Okay? So D is just trying to show you all this margin of the stomach, and then... Um, Stone canal over here at C. Okay. So the question is, what's E? So E is just an, another internal part of this. So I try to show the margin of the stomach here to show the outline of it, and E just shows you more internally of that stomach. Okay. All right. Because I always get asked, where does the stomach end and begin? It follows this margin here. Okay. Here's for the arthropods. Okay, know the very uh, hemi versus holo um, in terms of the life cycle here, uh, egg versus the larva, pupa, adult. Be able to sex them. We have one minute. Um, I actually want to get to the heart because that's the toughest part. That so let me just yes, sorry. Um, let's. I'm not going to go over the flow of the heart. You can read that very quickly. What I want to do is show you some images because that's going to be the more difficult part for you. Hard to get from the book. So this is the entire structure is the pluck. Here's the trachea here with collagenous rings leading to the lungs. Here's the diaphragm C. Here's the liver here. Barely see the gallbladder, but it's off over here filled with bile. What makes the bile? The gallbladder? Liver. liver. So the liver makes the... the 
bile, the gallbladder, the liver makes the bile, the gallbladder stores it. Hearts here, we move the pericardium. That's the sac surrounding it. That's A. Let's look at the heart here. Okay. Does B represent the left side of the heart or the right side? Right side, that is correct. The way we know that is because if you look at this wall here, this is much thicker here than this wall here. It means this is the left side, this is the right, that's the common mid wall, the septum. So this is an AV valve separating the atrium, which is up here, versus the ventricle. So what AV valve is this? Bicuspid, which AV valve is over here? Tricuspid. So what happens is these valves, the AV valves are designed like this, AV valves are designed like this, so the blood is free to flow in this direction. When the ventricle contracts, it will force the valves to close up. So the AV valve is closed. That's the lub that you hear with the heart cycle. You don't hear the valves open, but the semilunar valves would open, so blood would go out the semilunar valves. If it leads away from the heart, it's an artery. If it leads from the right ventricle to the lungs, it's the pulmonary artery. And when that semilunar valve closes, you hear the dub. Okay? So let's just try to identify some arteries versus veins, and then we're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Okay. Arteries are white. They have a lot of elastic tissue. They tend to remain open. Okay? And veins tend to collapse, and they're pinkish. Okay? Now, which artery is this? Not quite sure. What information would you want to be able to know if this is the aorta? or the pulmonary artery? What would you like? Chamber. So if I stuck a probe down this so you could see if it entered the left or right ventricle, would that help you know? Yes. So if the probe entered the left ventricle through this artery, which, which artery is it? The aorta. If the probe entered the right ventricle, pulmonary artery. So that's what you need to do. You identify it as an artery, and then you try to see which chamber it leads to. Now this isn't really easy to tell. This is actually the right side, but not really easy to tell. But I'm going to tell you it is. If it's the right side, which one? Pulmonary artery. Okay. Now here it's a little bit easier to tell. This wall here is really thick, and this wall here is really thin. So that makes this the left side. So which artery is it? Aorta. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry. We have to end it here. About 6.33. Good luck Wednesday night, and thanks for taking the class.